How are you doing? How are you? Okay. How do you like this? Were you here 10 years ago? No. No? All right. How do you like this one? It's wonderful. You having a good time? Yeah, I was able to do it. It did a great job for us. Well, it seems like it's really yeah, cool and it easy. Yeah, it feels wonderful. And, yeah. Bless I was, uh, I was backstage uh, uh, following Ken Kesey and Bill Graham around for a moment being, you know, whatever. And uh, Bill Graham sort of stood back and looked at it all and he said, 1982. Hard to believe. <laughs> I don't know. What is it about these concerts that you love so much? It's seen everybody. Our feeling of a family, we're a real unity. Yeah. One being seeing each other every time. Yeah. We know we'll be back around, you know, no matter where we go off in our little realms during the world times. Right. It brings us right back to it. I've been amazed at the number of people that I know uh -huh. uh, that I've seen. I mean, people I'd never expected to see again. Yeah. That I would see just... And they say hi, and they Bill, just, and they just kind of wander by. Yeah, they just wander through, and it's wonderful. Yep. All yeah. right. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah, we'll see you later. Okay. Hey! hey. <laughs> nice to see you, Representative Bradbury. Good to see you. You're looking wonderful. Commissioner Wimple. Oh, I love that picture. <laughs> <laughs> God, I love that picture. That's as I hear about Jerry's here selling chicken somewhere. Hey, you betcha, man. Dead chicken All right. corn right gotta there. I gotta go catch it up. I gotta <laughs> erase that deficit, huh? Well, we're working at it. All right. This will take care of the immediate creditors. How about bad is it? 30,000 rough. Oh, my God. Wow. Hey, we went for it, man. We could. We were going to pull right back on. in the last Good. week or two. And went, no, no, no. Quick, fuel it with his fake money. <laughs> Print some more money. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked. How's it going? Fine, fine. Right. I've been trying to log, which is about like fishing this time of, of a recession. You know? and no place to sell it. But we got some interesting things going. Some uh, uh, Pacific Rim markets. All right. Hardwoods and uh, Good. Japan and Good. things right like on. that. And you would, a few things like that. What are you doing on that? Because I'm, I'm working on a little fly show to take around the people about some of the things we're not doing and wood products that we could be doing. Well, I'll tell you what. Well, the best thing I could do would be to turn you on to the guy that's running the chicken booth over here. His name is Rick Herson. He's standing right behind Russ. All right. And he could tell you a whole bunch about the Pacific Rim. It's right out of that 18-page pamphlet. It's just millions there waiting for us. Four and an eighth by five and an eighth metrics. <laughs> it's, all you gotta do is move it a little. Just move a little bit. You got it. <laughs> Uh, were you here 10 years ago? God, I was in the area, but I didn't get out here. You didn't get out here? No, I didn't get out How, is it, Do you make a regular habit of getting to dead concerts? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, I don't. Not but I got to I'm this one. Curious. Uh, my name's Ed Wemple. I'm a small woodland owner from down near Cottage Grove, a few hundred acres down there for the past 10, 15 years. And I currently work in arranging timber and log and lumber sales overseas, primarily to China. I'm sure the irony of financing a stabilization fund through a lottery hasn't escaped anyone in this room any more than it's escaped me. And it really does point out that the timber industry in the Northwest is a real gamble, always has been, still is boom and bust. It doesn't have to remain that way, but I attended a conference that Don Flora was a speaker at a few weeks ago, and John Buter from OSU uh, pointed out that in his 25 years in the industry, he'd never been more uncertain about the future than today. And other speakers, while agreeing with that, also pointed out that this is the most opportune moment for the purchase of land and timber that they'd seen in the last 40 years if you have a plan. So you can go back and forth on this either way. I have some suggestions here, I think, where people might be able to take advantage of this situation if you have a plan. I've worked on cooperatives in the past. I worked help start the HODADs. I worked on the West Fur buyout to some extent, that mill in Oak Ridge. And I've worked with people's utility districts across the state to help them start replacing privately owned utilities. And there's always an argument not to do it. It won't work. It's not profitable. It's bad policy. But it's our best gamble now if you're going to gamble in the timber industry, and you have to. Because the industry is in transition. And my bet is that many of the new owners are going to find worker-owned mills to their advantage. Why? Because a lot of them are going to be absentee owners, absentee managers, and they're going to want stability, and they're going to want support from the local communities. 
the setting's been well pointed out by these gentlemen here in Northwest Timber. The old growth is almost gone, but with intensive management, there'll be a lot of small timber coming on. There'll be a lot of thinning that could be done now that would bring out small timber, and the intensive management will bring even more on. And there's always going to be a demand for Doug for the best for wood in the world for construction. The current owners in the industry, many of them, are stuck with high interest loans, as was pointed out from the boom part of the period five, six years ago. They're stuck with high federal stumpage that they're having to get bailed out on, and they're locked out of exporting logs, which is the main overseas market currently, as Mr. Hislop pointed out. Uh, so they want to sell. They want to sell their land, they want to sell their timber, and they want to sell their mills all together, big packages. I've seen 10 different pieces with about 6 billion board feet, half a million acres. They all have mills. They're all with timber. Some of it young timber, a lot of it young timber. And they want to sell the land too. Just get out, cash out for their own reasons. So who are the new owners? Overseas and institutional. And you can read that China and the insurance companies. Because China is the biggest market to come. They're going to want the timber over the next 20 years, maybe 50, until they get their own intensive management together. And the institutional investors, primarily insurance companies, see timber here in the Northwest. They do have a plan, and they do see it as a good investment, one that they can make, get in, and stay with for many years and give returns on those investments. Now, China, they, they want logs. They want logs now. But the problem is that the logs we're going to have available for them are small logs, and it takes a modern mill to get the best return from that. So they'd like to get our old growth, but that isn't going to be there much longer, and they have to make this transition. We would like to export lumber to them, semi-finished, finished lumber, so that our people are here working in the United States. Can't send the logs over, they don't want them, because their mills are set for the big logs, and they're not getting a good return. So they're going to have to either build the mills over there, which they will over time, and they're going to have to work with the mills here, the existing ones, to upgrade them so that they can use those small logs and get them semi-finished before they come over. And of course the insurance companies, the institutional investors, are looking for that long-term investment. But they both need local management, local support from the communities, because that brings stability. They're not playing the market for short-term investments, they're looking at long-term. So everyone benefits from this situation. Unlike the takeover situations, the hostile buyouts, we have a situation here today where in many cases there is potential benefit for all parties and perhaps this is not realized right at the moment by the buyers and the sellers, but it's something that uh, can be brought to their attention. Because the old owners will get out and they'll make cash in doing it, the new owners will get the logs and the lumber that they want. The community will get stability from the mill revenues. That adds up to stability all the way around. That's our main opportunity today, is to work with the new owners before a crisis as well as during, to anticipate, as has been pointed out here today. Take a little time beforehand. And as was pointed out last night by our keynote speaker, it's real tough to get money out of U.S. banks and to work with government agencies. It's kind of a heartbreaking talk last night to listen to uh, from Bob on uh, the lack of help from the government agencies and how many banks it took to get together the money just for one mill. But by joining with these new owners who don't want the mills, they want the land and timber. They want the investment. They want the logs over a long term. They don't want the mills. But the mills will add to what they have in their investment if it's explained. And we need to use our state and local officials who have been so helpful to communicate and to negotiate those needs to the new owners. Of course, they're not really new in the sense of foreign capital. It's always been here. The China's money's been here before. Japanese money's been here before. But it's escalating. And I think that the term fusion is the best term for what's needed now in Oregon and our timber industry in relating to overseas capital. I mean, of course, a peaceful fusion of capitalism and communism. Not the term that would be applied in harsher circumstances, but the world needs an example of peaceful fusion. 
China, of course, is moving towards capitalism. It's how you spark curiosity, you spark ambition, and that equals more production. And they have to reabsorb Taiwan, which is the golden goose of capitalism. And they have to do that without killing that golden goose. Oregon is right in the middle of this situation, this fusion situation that's coming. Because we have two sister states, and that equals preferential trade. One of them is with mainland China, a province in Fujian, which a fellow named William Mulholland took to our state legislature and had a measure passed with only one dissenting vote to make Fujian our sister state. Jerry Rust, county commissioner here in Lane County, went on that delegation over to begin that uh, situation, which is forever, be friends forever there. And our governor signed that, and he also signed proclamation with Taiwan. So we're right in the middle of a situation here that's going to require some diplomacy and some answering of economic questions. And we can all gain from the answers here. And China is going to want to reach acceptable terms as they come in to Oregon, as they bring their capital in. And to my mind, part of that equates to worker-owned mills. And Oregon has the best tools for this kind of fusion, cooperatives, we have land use laws where we've recently had it affirmed that the counties have a role to play in forest practices in determining how they will uh, be handled. We have the stabilization fund money to look at these initial buyouts to be a part of these initial sales. And we have helpful public officials. Bill Bradbury, who was here yesterday, state legislator, Jerry Russ, the whole legislature was helpful in finally passing this kind of measure. And with these tools, our communities can request of the new owners to be responsible to avoid this boom and bust cycle. Worker owned mills, long term contracts with the landowner for the use of that timber coming off the land to run through that mill, sensible forest practices, thinning applies in many cases with the young timber rather than the clear cutting practices of the past. No spray, there's another good practice that's been taken some time to institute. And I think we can, they can use the export and domestic markets to stabilize a situation that's been up and down, it's pointed out in graphs, it's been pointed out in this industry for years and years, rather than being stuck with one or the other, as current owners are. But we need a catalyst. Yesterday, Mr. Dawson pointed this out, Mr. Courtright pointed this out. Somebody has to take these pieces that are here now, put them together, because the people that are currently working in the mills have got their hands full. They need advice. And the people that have the fund aren't out looking for the opportunities to invest. There has to be a catalyst. And the people in this conference are the ones that are going to have to serve that purpose initially. Because you have to prevent a crisis from being the only time you take action. You have to anticipate. And this is our opportunity to work in the middle of an overseas need for timber and Oregon's need to avoid the boom and bust cycle of the current industry. But this combines really the best of central planning, local control. New owners that want stability, communities that want stability. And this, in this transition is our opportunity to step in and create a better economy that's in everyone's interest, not through contesting these situations as in the past, but by planning cooperation between interested parties, consultants, communities, investors, unions, Chinese government agencies. Thank you. Well, 37-year-old Ed Wemple of Eugene, known primarily for helping establish the Emerald People's Utility District, was found dead at his home yesterday morning. An autopsy by the Lane County Medical Examiner's Office last night revealed that Wemple died from a stroke. Wemple held a seat on the EPUD board since 1978 until he was defeated last year by Doug Still. Lane County Commissioner Jerry Rust had been a close friend of Wemple since the late 1960s, and he had this to say today. The Hodads organization, which which has brought about $12 million in income and created thousands of jobs here locally uh, is largely the result of Ed's vision and hard work. Uh, he was a tireless uh, tree planter. He, he always planted good trees. 
Wimple had been involved in public power issues before and after his involvement with EPUD. A memorial service has been scheduled for Saturday at the Wesley Center in Eugene at 2.30 in the afternoon. Sunday night at 8 p.m., a celebration of Wimple's life will be held at the WOW Hall, also in Eugene. The 37-year-old Wimple was well known for his leadership in the formation of the Emerald People's Utility District and his work with the Hodad's Tree Planting Cooperative. He was found dead in his home Wednesday morning. He reportedly died of an aneurysm in the brain. He was 37. Lane County Commissioner Jerry Rust has been friends with Wimple since they met in college 18 years ago. Wimple, he says, marched to the beat of high ideals. Finally, he found a way to channel that incredible energy in organizing this labor cooperative. Uh, planting trees, that sounded like a good idea. Sharing the uh, money among the workers, uh, that sounded like a good idea. Uh, later, he got involved in uh, politics. Russ says Wimple leaves behind quite a legacy. He tried to make sense out of this. Um, uh, he has the finest family, uh, the finest children. They're a reflection of the care and love that he put in them, so that's certainly a legacy. A memorial service will be held for Wimple Saturday afternoon at Eugene's Wesley Center. Sunday at 3, a celebration of his life will be held at Wow Hall. A memorial fund has been established. <coughs> A very different sort of past lives on, to some extent, in Eugene, Oregon, where a young man who was raised in a 60s-style hippie commune in radically non-traditional ways ponders his own particular place in the 1990s. When I come to major decisions in my life, lots of times I try to put myself in my father's shoes. He was like a hero to me, you know, everything he did was right in my eyes. And so I always try to put myself in his shoes to see what he would be doing. My name is Noah Wemple. I was born in 1970, which makes me 21 years old. From the ages of two until about 13, I lived up here on Cougar Mountain. This is where my parents came in 1972 and came with a number of other families and tried to start a new life up here. This is the road leading up to Cougar Mountain. We're leaving everybody behind. Everybody that went up there went up there for a, for a reason. They were all the same kind of people. They were part of the movement. They were the radicals. They were the hippies. They had the long hair. You know, they were they were the peace-loving people, and here was this mountain that they could live on and be away from everything else. This is the Cougar Mountain that I grew up on. It was basically almost, you know, a, a commune, and everything was, was shared. The whole living space was shared. Uh, you know, meals were shared. Food from the garden was shared. Work was shared. There's and although we don't live up oh. here anymore, we come up here just about every week. All the memories can't be erased, and so we try and keep it alive. Growing up in the commune, we all were very close. We all, you know, we all lived together for a number of years and became a very close, close knit family. One love, one I was uh, 15 when my father died, but I still feel that, you know, when I see the, the people that I used to live with, Good. I feel that, that they are part of my family, and that gives me a real sense of belonging. Pretty nice. And I have a lot of the same values and beliefs as they do. You know, they were for peace, they were against large companies uh, ruling the marketplace, and uh, we can't be wasteful, we can't be destructive the way we are. The whole world is slowly deteriorating and we're flushing things down the drain left and right. And that's, there's a lot of people from the, the counterculture that, uh, that you know, say, hey, that's, that's completely wrong, you know, we can't be wasteful like this. And that's, I have all those, those values and beliefs. Well, I won't back down. Well, this that we're looking at over here is is called a clear cut. This is when the the large timber companies go in to an area to a forest 
and they basically wipe everything clean. And that's one of the main things that I hope our generation can, can change is the forestry practices that are in effect right now. And this clear cutting practice is one of the ones that needs to go. You know, they can go in there and do selective logging and take the trees, you know, take some of the trees and leave some of the other trees. And sure, it'll take a little bit longer and they won't make quite as much money, but then we'll still have a forest. Thought we could change this world with words like love and freedom. There you have the U wood bench. Yeah, that didn't take long either. I'm done for the day. I'm going on strike. I have a lot of the same values as my parents, and in some ways I have a few that are a little bit different just because of the way I saw my upbringing. People around me when I was growing up, you know, money wasn't a thing that they worried about too much. But I could see from looking from the side that if they did have the money, boy, they could have done some great things. You know, they could have made some serious changes. I think that even though it sucks, money is important. I've read many real estate books about people that uh, go into real estate investing for short term and come out of it with some nice money and uh, that's where my interest in real estate started and now I'm in, I have a, a job where I do construction and remodeling and uh, I'm learning that trade and so that that furthers my interest in real estate because if I can invest into it, you know, I can, now I'll have the know-how to fix it up myself. I think that our generation is going to force the generations that above us to, you know, to take a look at us at what we're doing and what we're trying to do because we're just simply going to do it with or without them. You know, we are going to stand up and make a change in the world because I think that we're conscious enough to realize that we have to do that. If we are to succeed, we need to learn how to learn. And that's what my father told me over and over, was you just need to learn how to learn. And if you can do that, then you'll, everything else will fall in place.